In 2006, Sony released the PlayStation 3. I bought one at launch to use as a Blu-ray player as the game selection wasn't that great. Years later, that system froze while playing Final Fantasy XIII for several hours straight. I managed to back up my existing saves and transfer them to a slim model, leaving my original PS3 to collect dust. What happened? When PS3 started to fail within the first couple of years, various explanations started to pop up across the internet. The system definitely had thermal problems. It didn't cool very well. Suggestions for how to improve cooling included using a higher quality thermal paste or changing the cooling fan, for example. PS3 users began to report a problem with their systems wherein powering up resulted in the power light briefly flashing yellow before finally flashing red. This event quickly received the nickname the Yellow Light of Death. Paired with this name was the simple explanation that Sony used lead-free solder and the solder around the processors had cracked due to thermal stress. This explanation spread like wildfire throughout the internet. Where did it begin? What is the source? Why is it so easily accepted? It starts with, of all things, the Xbox 360. Microsoft knew the 360 had problems not too long after launching at the end of 2005. They admitted as much in the summer of 2007 and extended the warranty of any consoles that exhibited the Red Ring of Death to three years after the purchase date. The story of the Red Ring of Death is worth its own video, but our take from the 360 fiasco is simply the idea that the problem arose from using lead-free solder. In early 2003, the Restriction of Hazardous Substances Directive was adopted by the European Union. The directive restricts the use of various hazardous substances when electronic equipment is manufactured and it took effect on July 1, 2006. One notable substance on this list is lead. Naturally, this led to a mass adoption of lead-free solder. Solder is an alloy, a mix of different elements. A different mixture is going to mean different properties, and the properties for tin lead solder aren't going to be the same for something that is tin silver copper. Here's some of the solder I have. This one from Alpha Metals is your very traditional 60% tin, 40% lead. This lead-free one from Radio Shack is 96% tin and 4% silver. This unopened spool is mostly tin with both silver and copper. As you can see, different mixtures. If you think of large-scale production, you have many things to consider, such as manufacturing environment, melting point of the solder, the materials being joined by the solder, and more. You aren't going to use the same assembly process you've always used with lead-based solder and simply switch to lead-free. Studies on many aspects of using lead-free solder were performed as companies made the transition, but growing pains were inevitable as assumptions were going to be made. When the PS3 started to show signs of trouble via a brief yellow light, what Sony claims to be a general failure, it very quickly received a comparison to what people believe had happened to the Xbox 360. Red Ring of Death for the 360 became Yellow Light of Death for the PS3. The 360 allegedly had issues caused by the use of lead-free solder, therefore Sony must have the same problem. What sort of analysis was done for this to be reported as THE problem for the PlayStation 3 that resulted in the Yellow Light of Death? an analysis so easily accepted across the web. As far as I can tell, there was no real analysis, at least none using an accurate sample size of yellow-lit PS3s, and therefore no conclusive evidence given to suggest that Sony had an Xbox 360 rate of failure, and that said failure was always caused by problems with the solder used. It is, perhaps, a gigantic assumption based on what people believed happened to the Xbox 360, and a report made on a television show back in 2009 that received strong words from Sony and has also been pulled from official channels. If you trace citations from message forums, articles, videos, and more over the last decade, you'll probably land on statements based on one or both of these two things. Here are some specifics from the TV report. 1. Sony says that there are various reasons that can cause the PS3 to give the yellow light, and they can't say for sure what the problem is without taking the machine apart. This makes sense to me. Yellow light means the system has a problem and it needs to be diagnosed properly. 2. X-rays were taken and displayed on the TV series that showed trapped gas in the circuit board. And it was reported that Sony responded to this saying that wasn't what the problem was. The X-ray was only shown for a few seconds on the show and not much of an explanation was given. I've seen a few people cite this as the Eureka moment when it comes to mass diagnosis, despite the fact the show didn't actually explain what was being shown. 
Three, in a pre-recorded story that aired during the show, a team of people the TV show assembled repair a PS3 by shoving it into a special oven to perform a reflow of the solder, and that appears to fix the problem. After returning from the story, the host stated that, by the way, four of the 11 PS3s they fixed had already stopped working. I'll accept Sony's statement, diagnose the problem. As for the other two items, I have issues with them. My first is non-technical. I do not believe that you can take an x-ray of a single console and conclude that you have found the cause for every PS3's yellow light of death. One console is not an accurate sample size for mass diagnosis. As a matter of fact, why would you ever make a mass diagnosis of a general fault and apply a blanket fix to 11 PlayStation 3s based on a single x-ray? Next up, we're going to get technical. If you're new to this channel, welcome, and please fasten your seatbelt. The PS3 central processor and graphics processor are built and attached to the motherboard using FC BGA technology. FC stands for flip chip, a term that refers to the assembly method for the processor. We'll detail that shortly. BGA stands for ball grid array, which refers to the method used to connect the chip to the PS3 motherboard, an array of solder balls. Those of you that have built computers over the years know a little something about the term grid array. This Intel Core i7 processor uses a land grid array. The processor has a grid of landing spots underneath it that sit on a bed of pins when placed in a socket on a motherboard. LGA, land grid array. An earlier processor, such as this 486DX2, uses PGA, which stands for pin grid array. It has pins underneath. Both processors can be added to or removed from a motherboard with the appropriate socket. Ball grid array is a mounting method wherein solder balls between the chip and the motherboard are reflowed to join the two together. Let's take a quick look at the layers of a flip chip BGA solution. There are three main layers to consider, the die and the substrate of the chip and the PCB, a motherboard in our case, to which the chip will connect. The die is the workhorse. This is where everything happens, an integrated circuit made up of many tiny transistors. The substrate is part of the CPU's package and is used as a mounting interface to connect the die to the motherboard as well as hold support components, such as capacitors that need to be as close to the die as possible. A conventional method for die substrate connection is to mount the die on the substrate and then electrically connect the two using wires from the top of the chip to the top of the substrate. In the early 1960s, IBM started us down the path of using an alternative method for interconnections. Rather than using wires, solder bumps are placed on the metal terminals at the top of the chip. The chip is flipped over and paired with metal pads with identical spacing on the substrate. The bumps are then reflowed to create a bond between the die and the substrate. To finish the package, an insulating substance called underfill is injected between the bumps and a heat spreader lid is placed over the top. Thermal paste is used between the die and the heat spreader and the spreader is glued to the substrate along its edges. There is your flip chip sandwich. Oversimplified, but hopefully understandable. The last step is to use a ball grid array of solder balls to connect the CPU package to the motherboard. Some enthusiasts have removed the lids from the processors in order to replace the thermal paste between the lid and the die. If you look at this photo, you can see the die in the center along with the gray underfill for each of the two processors. The GPU has a few extra components mounted to its substrate. With a bit of background on the basic assembly of a flip chip and how it connects to the motherboard, let's return to the cross-section illustration. Okay, the claim typically associated with the yellow light of death is that the solder balls that connect the processor to the motherboard are no longer making proper electrical connection due to cracking from thermal stress. When the TV series mentioned earlier elected to use their special oven to reflow the board, they didn't isolate a problem. They actually changed a lot of variables by applying extreme temperatures across the entire board. This doesn't specifically reflow the GPU and CPU solder balls, it reflows pretty much everything. A second method people turn to is reballing. It is as simple as it sounds. The board is heated up in a localized area to free the solder balls, the processor and old solder balls are removed, and then the processor is reattached to the board using fresh solder balls, either lead-free once again or with lead this time. Both a reflow and a reball still involve playing a wild card, heat. 
Whether the entire board is heated up or just the area where the processor is mounted, the heat is naturally going to affect other things, especially cranked up to reflow temperatures for lead-free solder. There is also a concern that the problem stemming from excessive heating and cooling is not in the lead-free solder balls that connect the processors to the board, but rather the solder bumps that connect the die to the substrate. Reliability can be compromised because of a large thermal expansion difference between the two layers. The underfill used as part of the package is supposed to help improve reliability by reducing shear stress on the solder bumps, but by the way, the underfill used on flip chips of this era has also been cited as problematic. As for the x-ray shown in the TV show that claimed gas pockets in the circuit board, they could be referring to what are called voids in the solder balls used, which are not inherently bad. There are many different types of voids. I won't go into the details on this topic, but wanted to mention it. Again, these are all theories given with no evidence of one or more being the problem that causes a PS3 to experience a yellow light of death. For all the possibilities mentioned, if you're heating the entire board or just the processor area of a PlayStation 3, you are throwing a wild card cure-all at what is essentially an unknown problem. So is that it? Regardless of the specifics, we can assume the problem is still most likely in or under the chip somewhere? No, it gets better. Enter NEC Tokin and their special capacitors. Let's talk about processors for a moment. They can be demanding. They want proper, clean power now and to be kept cool. We already know the PS3 is struggling a bit when it comes to the cooling. Let's focus on power. If a processor expects, say, one volt for power, that is what it wants. It doesn't want to have one-ish volts on a regular basis, and it doesn't want one volt to suddenly have the bottom fall out of it and drop to half a volt for just a moment, only because something else needed a lot of power and the power supply was a bit slow to respond to the demand. The power rails that supply a processor typically need a support team of capacitors in order to help maintain power. Decoupling capacitors store extra energy that can be used to help maintain the voltage. So what about these capacitors? Well, they were developed in the early mid-2000s and apparently have a rather short lifespan. Toshiba laptop users discovered this the hard way when their computers wouldn't start. The solution is to remove the specialized capacitor and work in four tantalum capacitors in its place, making sure the replacement's capacitance total meets or exceeds the original cap and that the ESR remains just as low. This restores the laptop to working order. It seems to be a very common problem and repair with the Toshiba A300. And of course, the PlayStation 3 uses eight of these same capacitors, four on each side of the motherboard, two pairs for each processor. If these caps can't help maintain proper voltage for the CPU or GPU, guess what? Yellow light of death. Some capacitor types can come back to life and do their job after adding, you guessed it, heat. I can't say for certain if these particular capacitors could temporarily return to meeting the PS3's needs if they are blasted with a bit of heat for diagnostic purposes, but I can say that certain guides found on the net actually recommend using a heat gun on these chips, as they call them, as part of PS3 repair. So what is wrong with your yellow lit PS3? The most appropriate answer is, I don't know. You can either assume or you can diagnose. Assuming is easier. Of course, there are easy fixes that don't require diagnosing a problem. It is a fair assumption that the original capacitors in your Sega Game Gear have failed and need to be replaced. The point of this video is to state that very little research has been done to facilitate an assumption that the solder balls in the PS3 are the primary reason for a yellow light of death situation. I want to make it clear that I'm not saying a reball isn't a potential fix for a PS3 yellow light of death. My point is that it isn't the solution and that we as a community should adopt less of a tunnel vision approach when it comes to diagnosing and repairing consoles. Thanks for watching.